Good morning and welcome. My name is Gavin, and I'm one of the pastors for our church. Congratulations, you made it to church through the snowpocalypse of 2018, y'all. This is amazing. I'm just kidding. It hardly snowed. Some churches closed. Soft? I mean, I'm not saying they're soft, but I mean, I mean, come on. It's Nebraska. It's a half an inch. Anyway, whatever. We're going to preach the Bible. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 22. We're going to wrap up the series on the life of King David this morning, uh, looking at this last chapter, and we're going to take a look at David's song of deliverance. I don't know about y'all, but growing up, I didn't watch a ton of TV, but there was one TV event weekly that I always tuned into, and it was the Friday night TGIF lineup on ABC. How many of you guys remember the good old days of TGIF when the leadoff was Full House and Family Matters? Yep. Any children of the 90s right here? Yes, those were the good days. I remember rushing to the television. I think it would start at six or seven. We would finish dinner and I would have my stonewashed jeans neatly tight rolled and my fluorescent t-shirt on and my mullet fluffed out and I would sit up close to the TV and I would laugh at Uncle Joey or Steve Urkel. You remember Steve? Got me cheese. And I would try to hide my secret crush on DJ Tanner. You remember DJ? My sister always thought I had a crush on the younger sister. What was her name? Stephanie. Stephanie. Uh-uh, it was DJ. She was older. I know I was out of my league, but I really thought if God just, you know, providentially lined it up to where we could meet, I would win her over. But every week I would watch TGIF, and one of the hallmarks of the Full House TV series was that no matter how much drama ensued, no matter what family chaos, no matter what new boyfriend DJ had and Uncle Joey kicked him out or whatever, somehow magically at like minute 27 or 28, everything came to perfect closure and clarity. Uncle Jesse or Danny Tanner would sit at the end of the bed with the kids and they would talk about what they experienced and they would extend forgiveness to each other and they would hug it out and they would end with this little pithy life lesson that they could apply and then the credits would roll. And I love that. The problem is, in my own life, that has never happened to me. <laughs> that moment never happens. And actually this week, in these past several weeks, as I've been looking at the end of the story, I think that I was looking at David's life and I was tasked with wrapping up this series this week. How do I kind of tie a bow around the story of uh, King David and his life? I'm looking for that Uncle Jesse moment at the end of the bed. Hey, here's the neat little tidy story. Here's the bow of conclusion and clarity that we can wrap, about, wrap around this and move on to our Advent series next week. And yet as I read from 2 Samuel 12 to the end, all I see is more carnage, more chaos, more seasons of the messy middle. There's no neat and nice little bow to tie onto this story at the end of David's life. And as I wrestled through, okay, Lord, how do I land this plane? There's 10 chapters left to go. And, and, and where do we really land the plane on this series? Staring right in front of me in chapter two, I saw that from David himself, he gave me a tool to understand his story. He gave me a tool to understand as he processes his own life and story, how I can begin to not only understand and tie a bow around David's life, but maybe my own story. In fact, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, what we see is a song. This is David looking back. At this point, he's likely an old man. He's got scars. He's battle-worn. He's tired. With wrinkles on his face, he's looking back at his story and creatively and poetically retelling all the crazy events that he has been through. And then, with a posture of praise, he, he moves on forward in life with a, with a spirit and a heart that's warm and soft toward God. All around this story is more drama and chaos. You know, in, in Sunday school, usually when we study the life of David, we usually end like after he kills Goliath or after he enters the throne or after um, he you know, flees from Saul or maybe even after he repents of his sin like we studied last week. But that isn't the case. It's more battle. It's more chaos. In fact, um, after last week's story, what happens, one of David's sons, Amnon, violates his daughter Tamar, and then his other son, Absalom, kills Amnon for what he did to Tamar. David's then on the run, uh, once again for his life, kicked out of the nation of Israel. The, life, the, the whole thing is chaos. 
And then he gets back onto the throne, and towards the end of the story, um, he does a bonehead move and, and does a census in a sinful way and counts his troops and, and quits relying on God in such a way that 70,000 men in Israel are killed as an act of judgment by his folly and foolishness and sin. And in the midst of this, you find this song that he wrote. And in the midst of the chaos, you see David looking back at all the chaos and carnage and drama and you see him look back and see the mighty hand of God in his past in a way that helps him move forward in a posture of praise. It's all encapsulated in this song. What's interesting about it, it's not, it doesn't stay a personal song. It starts as a very personal thing. This is David's sort of prayer journal saying, here's where I've seen God. Here's where I'm not going to allow myself to be bitter or angry, but I'm going to be a man who continues to worship God. And we see that 2 Samuel 22 is actually rewritten in corporate form, and it becomes Psalm 18 which becomes a corporate song for all of God's people in Israel to so too look back in the past, see the mighty hand of God, and then move forward in a posture of praise. And as I looked at this this week and in the weeks prior to this, I realized that in here, we found a tool not only to understand David's story or Israel's story, but also our own stories. I think there's some key perspective that David gives us on the character and nature of God that was so true in his heart that he had landed on and settled on that allowed him to have this posture. And I think if you and I will give attention to it this morning, we're going to start to see the hand of God in our own stories. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the end of my life and be the guy who's bitter, resentful, angry, cranky. I don't have uh, that Uncle Jesse moment with all the stories and relationships in my life. And neither did David. And yet, like David, I want to be like him at the end of my life. So you know what? God has been good to me. And even in my old age, my heart is going to be tender to the Lord and worship him. And I think he wants that for all of us this morning. So what I want to do is I just want to sort of die, digest and dissect and investigate this psalm. What did David see in the character and nature of God that allowed him to be an authentic worshiper of God, even into a senior season and to the very end of his life? And so I want to just highlight three um, attributes of God that David saw. Uh, that we're going to see in this psalm together. Here's the very first one. The first thing we see is David knew that God is personal. God is personal. It all starts here for David. In fact, look in uh, chapter two or 22, verses 2 and 3. David says, And the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. Ten times in two verses, David uses the first person singular possessive adjective, my. If you went to Wayne State, just Google that. First person singular adjective. <laughs> David is saying he is my God. He is my rock. That's how he starts this psalm at the very end. Verse 47, look at what he says. He says, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. To David, God is not just a rock, a fortress, a salvation, a refuge, a deliverer. He is David's rock, fortress, shield, and refuge. He is David's deliverer and savior. To David, God is personal, and it all starts there for him. Now, within traditional religions, there are a myriad of views of understanding how God relates to his people. Okay, so within many traditional religions, the idea is that God is a distant deity. He is holy, he is other, he is transcendent, he is out there, if you will. And if you can arouse his approval, if you can make the cut, if you can do enough good, you will be entered into paradise or heaven or nirvana or enlightenment. But in most traditional religions, the, the aim or the benefit of the afterlife is, is the benefits therein, the feasting, the great gifts, the great food, the pleasure, or the peace that comes in the afterlife. But for most of those traditional religions, God is like a distant father. He's, he's like the dad who sends a child support check but never comes to the birthday party. Uh, conversely, other religions like pantheistic, panentheism, so many tribal and um, native languages, the idea is that God isn't transcendent, he's very near. So the idea is that God is in the world, he's in you, he's in me, he's in nature and the snow and the animals, and he's in this room. And so God is near, but he's not distinct. There is no creator-creation distinction. 
But the Bible affirms that God is in every way distinct from and unique from all of creation. He is creator, everything else is creation, and yet he chooses to interact in and with his creation in a very personal way. In fact, that God has created humans as the crowning or the crown jewel of his creation, made in his image and likeness, and he made us to relate to him. The idea being that, yes, God made you, but he also knows you and he loves you and he takes interest in you. David knew that God is personal, not just abstract. That's why he says, look at verse 20. He says, God brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. David knew that God took interest in him. That word delighted can be translated to take pleasure in or simply to like. He's saying, God likes me. God doesn't just tolerate me. He doesn't just begrudgingly help me. He helped me because he takes interest in me. He knew that God enjoyed him and delighted in him. God is personal. We have to start there. Now, I have to say this real quick. If some of you are new to the Bible, you need to know this. All of the Bible tells this amazing story of how God created us, human beings, in his image, and he created us for relationship. This is not just a Christian cliche. This is not warm, fuzzy evangelicalism. This is the truth of our God and our Bible, that God created the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, for relationship, to walk with him, to know him, to enjoy him, to worship him. That is why you and I were created. But but the Bible says we have been separated from that relationship. Why? Because of sin. We have chosen to disobey God, be a God unto ourselves, live as our own Savior and Lord, and we have broken that relationship. But the Bible says that God came on a ransom, a rescue mission mission to reunite us and God back together into relationship. And so God comes in the person of Jesus. He pays the penalty for our sins. He earns a righteousness that we couldn't do. He obeys all the laws of God as our substitute. And when we trust in him personally, we are reunited in relationship with God. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, uh, people like David entered into this relationship when they had faith or trust that God would send the Savior, Jesus Christ. You and I, on the other side of Jesus, enter into this relationship when we trust and receive Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. And when we do that, God is no longer just a God or the God. He becomes our God. He is ours, and we are his, and we are in relationship. And in this relationship, and only in this relationship, we can experience life as it was intended to be lived. Knowing God, loving God, worshiping God, walking with God. If your life feels empty or void in some level, could it possibly be? It's because you are not in relationship with God. So David can look back on his story and he can see that everything he went through, the highs and lows, the goods and the bads, everything he went through, he went through it in relationship with his God. I don't know about you, but part of my story is I grew up knowing a fair amount about God. I grew up in a uh, reasonably religious home. I knew the Ten Commandments. I knew some truths of the Bible, but I didn't know God personally. I wasn't in relationship with him until I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was 16. And at that point in time, I went from knowing about God to knowing God. And since that time, he has not been a distant deity or a theoretical source of power. He's been a divine friend. He's been real to me. He's not just on paper. Like there have been seasons when I got dinged up by people that I trusted and were close to me. And in those times, Jesus was my healer. When I married my wife, we had three amazing kids. I look back and think, man, Jesus has been my good gift giver. He's personal to me. Uh, When I've gone through seasons of fear and anxiety that I've shared openly, God has been my healer. He's been personal with me through that all. Jesus isn't a distant deity, you guys. He is a personal God to be related with, and we can only relate to him when we come to him through Jesus Christ. He is my God, and I am his God. And so I want to ask you, do you know God personally? Is he your God? You were designed to know, love, and walk with God until you've been restored to God through Jesus. You are not in relationship with God. You are separated, and you need to come to trust Jesus Christ. And when that happens, the God becomes your God. And here's what we learn when we understand that God is personal. Here's the second truth that David shows us that we need to latch on to is that God is present. God is personal, and God is present. So when you are in relationship with God, you need to realize you will never face a single battle alone. 
That's what caused David to rejoice in this song of deliverance. Verse 7, he says, In my distress I called upon the Lord. To my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. He said, God was with me. God heard my cries for help. In my rough seasons, it was God who was there. Now, what's really interesting about this passage, remember we are in 2 Samuel chapter 22. What's fascinating is what falls on either side, 2 Samuel 21 and 2 Samuel 23. On either side, we get a list of these men called David's mighty men. There's the three, and then there's the 30. And so we have two chapters two chapters that bookend this chapter that tell about these crazy, amazing dudes that were in David's corner through it all. As you read these stories, you realize these are some amazingly tough, battle-hardened men. Okay, these were not like Wayne State athletes, like soft, don't show up to church when it snows a little bit. These are like Navy SEALs, Army Rangers. These are some bad, bad dudes in a good way. You with me? And so the Bible says that one of them killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Why is that, bi- that verse in the Bible? I have no idea, but it's one of my favorite, right? It's just saying these are some tough dudes. Like it was snowing and he was in a pit and there was a lion and he won and the lion lost. That's a hardcore dude. It says that one dude killed 800 men by himself in one battle. That's a lot of blood. I don't know. That's like an R-rated moment, but they're saying these are some tough hardcore dudes. It says that one dude was in a battle and all he had was his little staff that he was using to tend the sheep. And it said they came across this Egyptian guy and the Gavin paraphrases that his muscles had muscles. It says he was a very strong man and he had a spear. He looked like the Russian dude from Rocky IV, like big old muscles and traps and biceps. And it says that David's mighty men took his little staff and knocked the spear away and they went toe to toe and he grabbed the spear and took the Russian Rocky dude out in that moment. He's painting pictures that he had some tough dudes in his corner, right? And they weren't only just tough, they were faithful. They were loyal. You think about David's experience one minute. He's, he's the prince of all of Israel. Everyone singing his praises. His dudes were with him in that moment when he was on the throne, when he had the riches. Next moment, he's exiled from his own kingdom. He's on the run. Guess who's with him? His mighty men. They were with him when he was feasting. They were with him when he was famining. They were loyal and they were tough. And so you might get to this chapter, chapter 22, and think David would sing, when I cried to my homeboys, they were there. When I cried out to my posse, they were loyal to me. When I cried out to my tribe, man, they were faithful, but he doesn't do that. What does he say? He said, in those moments, I cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard my cries. The Lord was present with me. He doesn't say, man, Jonathan was there when Saul was trying to kill me. He doesn't say it was Nathan who came and confronted me. He gives all of his praise to God. Why? David knew that in every battle, in every fight, in every trial, in every tragedy, it was God's presence that was defending and protecting him. He knew that it was God that was by his side. It was God in every detail. It was God who was fighting his battles. It was God who had provided his mighty men for him. And at every turn, God was present. And even that group of men around him, they were there because God sent them as help. He realized that God is personal and God is present in his story. I want to ask you this morning, if you live with a daily conscious awareness that God is with you, odds are if you're a Christian, you understand that Jesus loves you, that Jesus saved you, but if you learn to realize in every moment that Jesus is with you, That in every moment, God is present with you. That's so important to understanding your own story. If you're going to be able to look back and and, and understand all of the moving parts of your own story and move forward with a posture of praise like David did, you're going to have to understand, number one, that God is always with you, and two, in your past, in every moment in your memory, you were never alone. In the moments of great triumph, God was with you. In the moment of great tragedy, God was with you. When your baby was born, God was with you. When you buried that baby or a loved one prematurely, God was with you. God is personal and God is present. I think that as Christians, one thing we need to do is is learn to um, disciple our vocabulary, our words into reflecting this reality. As Christians, we don't look back and say, yeah, I was sick and I got better. No, 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 no. We say, I was sick and God healed me. We don't look back and say, yeah, I... I lost my job, and that was a tough season. We say, no, Jesus Christ carried me through an insanely difficult season. 
We don't look back and say, we had a baby. We look back and say, God gave us life. We don't look back and say, my friends helped me through a hard time. We say, God gave me people that sustained me through a difficult time. When we see the presence of God in our story, both in our triumphs and in our trials, they become a testimony to God's grace to a watching world all around us. David both conquered kingdoms and he buried children and through it all, he could look back and say God was personal to me and God was present in all of it. And because of that, he can move forward with a posture of praise. How about you? In your own story, do you realize that God is your God and that through it all, he has been with you in every single moment? If we wanna move forward with a heart that's not bitter, resentful, angry, discontent, we have to be able to look back at our story and say God has been personal and you know what, God has been present. And here's the last thing that David's going to show us. The last attribute of God I want us to see is that God is powerful. God is powerful. Now, that may seem like a simple Sunday school statement or like I just came up with a third P because it was alliterated and it worked. Maybe. No, not the case. Let me show you what I mean from the text. David goes out of his way to say, my God, my rock, my fortress. He's personal. He's going to say, God was present. When I cried out, it was the Lord who heard me. The third thing, he's gonna paint this picture of the power of God that sustained him through it all, that gives him a reason to move forward in praise. Let me show you first, David described the situation he was up against, okay? As he looks back on his story and he thinks about his trials, how does he describe his trials? How does he describe his enemies? Look at verses five and six. He said, for the waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. And so this is David, not only as a warrior and as a king, but as an artist and a poet using words to paint a picture of what he was up against. He said, the waves of death encompassed me. He's saying death was like a big old wave, not like them little waves that are gonna hit your ankles on the shore. They were waves that were encompassing me. Death was crashing in upon me. He says, the torrents, that's like a heavy downpour of rain. The torrents of destruction assailed me. He said, everywhere I went, destruction was hitting me in the face. He says, the cords of Sheol entangled me. Sheol means death, or it can be um, a saying for hell itself. He's saying hell is coming up out of the ground, trying to pull me down. He says, the snares of death confronted me. A snare is a trap. He's saying, every step I took, death was trying to pull me under. My point is, David doesn't look back on his story through rose-colored lenses and say, yeah, life was pretty easy, hashtag blessed, so I will move forward in praise. No, 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 he doesn't have to whitewash his past in a sort of evangelical happiness uh, way of, of viewing life and say, God bless me. He said, no, no, actually, death was everywhere. My life, in some ways, was very, very, very hard. Everywhere I stepped, it was difficult. And as you read back on his story, you know this was true. David had a rough go of it. His enemies were mighty. Think about it. He had enemies within Israel, in his own country, where he's the anointed king. King Saul wants him dead. His own son Absalom wants him dead. He's on the run. He's got his whole, whole army that he used to lead, trying to hunt him down and kill him. So he's got enemies in Israel. He's got enemies outside of Israel. The Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Amalekites, probably the Mosquito Bites, all of them wanted him dead. His, his arch nemesis, the Philistines, wanted him dead. He's not safe in Israel. He's not in safe, safe outside of Israel. And we saw even last time when Big Cliff preached that some of his biggest enemies were right inside of himself. His lust, his pride, his adultery, his murderer, or his murder. David's saying, listen, I had enemies out there, in there, in here, everywhere around me, destruction was upon me. But David also knew that bigger than the storm of his trials was the storm of his salvation. Because not only does he downplay what he was up against, he's, he's also going to take a moment and paint a picture of the God who came to rescue him. In fact, let me just read verses 8 through 18. Listen to his artistic word pictures of the power of this God who came to save him. It says, And the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him his canopy. Thick clouds a gathering of water. 
out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. What a picture. He's saying, yeah, my my enemies were huge, but let me tell you about my God. He came down from the heavens with such force that, that even the oceans were peeled back so you could see the channels underneath. The earth was quaking. He's coming down on the wings of angels. Glory's going out. But, but here's what's interesting that I want you to think about as you think back on the story. Do you ever remember these events happening? I mean, like in the narrative, did you ever read the part where like the oceans were laid bare and God comes out of the heaven? We don't see it. In fact, as you read back through, you're like, no, it just looks like you went to war and then you got out of it and then someone tried to kill you and then some of your buddies helped you and and you made it through it. And so so why all this word picture of the power of your God? Here's why. I think David could see that in the midst of it all, it was God's powerful and sovereign hand that was weaving through his story that was really the one protecting him in all of it. David knew that his enemies were great. He didn't downplay that, but he knew that his Savior was greater still. David looked back on his life and said, I was up against some things, but it wasn't providence that brought me through. It wasn't the power of my might. It was the powerful hand of God that saved me from my enemies. And so I just want to ask you the question this morning. Can you look back on your life and see seasons that God has delivered you from? Can you look back in your own story and realize, man, there were, there were times in my life where I didn't know if I was going to make it through. And can you not but see the powerful hand of God that met you there, that brought you to the other side of it? And can I just humbly suggest that if you look back on your story and you're not a person of genuine worship, if your heart is not really warm toward God, if you don't love to sing to him and focus on him and, and be with him and meditate on him, that that it's very possible that, number one, you have vastly underestimated the power of your enemies that you have been up against, and number two, you have vastly underestimated the power of your God that has brought you through. What are our enemies? Number one, the biggest enemy is sin. What is our enemy that we're up against? Sin. Sin. Sin has caused our separation from God. Our own sin has led to our spiritual death. Sin was pulling us under like a snare of death. It's by the, but the grace of God, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, it is but the grace of God that he has come down and made your heart warm toward him and respond to the gospel. It is Jesus Christ more powerful than your sin that came and took your sin and put it on the cross. Amen? We have powerful enemies, but we have a more powerful Savior. Did you know the devil is real? Can I just say that? What are our enemies? It's sin. We have another one. It's called the devil. And the devil is not like some cartoon character that sits on your shoulder and tries to get you to do bad things. He is real. And the Bible says he's on this world. He's not out there somewhere. He's here and he wants to kill you. The Bible says that he is the father of lies. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the tempter of God's children. You have a very real enemy that wants to devour your life and your soul. Your enemy is great. But guess what? If you can look back and say, you know what, even if for this week alone I did not careen my life into a hot dumpster fire of sin, carnage, and death, it's because it was God who sustained you and empowered you and helped you to say no to the temptations of the evil one. Amen? Our enemies are huge, but our Savior is greater still. That's why David could look back on his life and say, I had some horrible enemies, but I had a mighty God. And that's why he can move forward with a posture of praise. Can I just say, if you're here in this room this morning and your physical heart is beating, if your lungs are taking in air, if you can have a smile on your face and enjoy the snow outside, that it is no short of a miracle of God who created you and protected you and is sustaining you in the midst of powerful enemies all around you. How do we look at our story and move forward in a posture of prayer? By seeing the powerful hand of God. Some people look back on their stories and they will just miss it. They will look back and say, yeah, we went through a hard season, but we took the Dave Ramsey class and we budgeted and and we tied and we had a new program and we dug ourselves out of debt. Okay, well, good. You know, our marriage is on the rocks, but we read the book and and I know the love language is and and his is number two and hers is number three and and we worked through it and applied some principles and now we're still married. Okay, well, that's great. You know, I was just in the right place at the right time. 
Okay, but can we not also say in every one of those moments, was it not the powerful hand of God that has spared your soul, spared your relationship, spared your life, protected you on the ice driving in this morning? Can we not see that through it all, there is a personal and a present and a powerful God who has sustained you? Man, I look back at my own life and think the fact that I'm even here is a miracle of God. The fact that I'm a Christian, that is the power of God. When I was 16, I was not looking for Jesus. I was looking for a cute girl. But God is personal and he was present and he was powerful to take me to that Bible study, to show me my sin, to show me my Savior. I think praise God for his powerful, sovereign hand in my life. I look back at my beautiful family, my beautiful wife. I think, man, I don't have game to get a girl like that. Nerdy white kid from Waverly, there's no way. It was God's grace to fill my life with amazing people, friends like Chris, my beautiful life, this church family. I cannot look back and, and not see the powerful hand of God who's done amazing things in my life. I can't help but look back and say, who planted City Light Church? Jesus Christ. It's been the powerful hand of God to sovereignly put some people together that were serious about preaching the Bible and making disciples and planting churches. No two knuckleheads, no small family room of anyone. It's been the powerful hand of God. As I look back on my story, I just see that all along it has been God. And I just wonder about your own story. If you didn't just look back for a moment with a, with a lens like David has in 2 Samuel 22, if you wouldn't see the mighty hand of God in your life that he is personal, that he has been present, and that he is powerful. I want to land this plane on uh, this psalm called the Grateful Retrospect, with just a couple things of application. Number one, I just want to say it again this morning. If you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, your story won't make sense. To be a human being and to, to walk through life disconnected, not in relationship with God, it won't make sense, and it won't lead to life, and it won't lead to joy, and ultimately it will lead to judgment and destruction. But the good news of the gospel is that God doesn't want to leave you there. He has come to reconcile you back into relationship with him. So if God is tugging on your heart this morning, we're not going to play some nice music to try to manipulate you to walk down the aisle. I just want you to listen to the voice of God. If he is stirring in your heart, is it possible that the powerful hand of God has brought you through the snow to sit here this morning to hear this message of love that you can be reconciled back to God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that when you enter into that relationship, the God moves from being the God to becoming your God in relationship with you. He wants to take your sins. He wants to give you life. He wants to take your anxiety. He wants to give you joy. He wants to take your regret. He wants to fill you with hope. And he offers you something so much better than an Uncle Jesse moment at the end of your bed, just saying everything's going to be okay. He's actually going to do better because he's going to come again and he's going to make it okay. That Jesus is going to come again, and the Bible says he's going to undo every wrong thing. So he's not just going to take us out of this world escapism. He's going to come to this world, and he's going to make all wrong things right. He's going to make all sad things come untrue. He's going to restore the kingdom to earth, and you're going to come, and you're going to feast at his table free of charge because Jesus Christ has paid your entrance fee. It is so good. The kingdom of God is available to you this morning. And so I just want you to know God is personal, God is present, and God is powerful, and he's inviting you to trust in him. If you would uh, love to receive Jesus this morning, maybe today would be your day of salvation. I preached the same text two weeks ago, and I got to pray with a young man, 25 years old, who gave his life to Jesus Christ. What a joy. This morning, I'm going to be in the back, and I would love to pray with you, and a whole team of volunteers will be back there to pray with you as well. Would you trust Christ this morning? And then second of all, I just want to remind us all, I've already said it, but what would it look like if we all look back on our own stories, and we just saw that, yeah, through it all, God has been with me, hasn't he? God has been present. God has been personal. God has been good. God has been powerful. What if we as a church family look back on our own story and said, this is a miracle that we're here, you guys. We are gathered. The preaching of God's word, the gospel is going forth. Churches are being planted. And, and if we didn't just say, God is powerful. God is amazing. And if we didn't, like David, actually have a heart of praise and worship to God. What if we actually sang our songs like we meant them? What if we actually said, God, you are beautiful and you are amazing and we meant it? 
What if we actually raised our voices and raised our hearts and raised our hand and declared that God is good? Can I just say I desire for our church to be a worshiping church? I don't want us to be a crowd that gathers because we have to. I want us to be a worshiping community that comes together because we get to, because God is worthy. And so would we see his story in our story and turn it all back to praise like David did in Psalm or 2 Samuel chapter 22. And finally this morning, uh, we're going to do as we always do. We're going to take a meal of grateful retrospect. And taking the Lord's uh, table together, what we're doing is we are remembering the mighty work of God in a posture of praise. And so this morning, um, we're going to take communion together, and I want us to remember the work of God in our lives. Listen to the instructions uh, for communion out of 1 Corinthians 11. It says that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, when he had given thanks, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he gave it to them saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we're gonna take this meal of remembrance together. And as you come forward, would you remember the mighty work of God? What he has done for you and would you respond in praise? If you're new, uh, the communion servers are gonna come up front. They will be in the back. You come forward. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given him your sins and received his eternal life, you're welcome to the Lord's table. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this meal is not for you. This is only for those who have trusted in Christ. But if this morning you would be willing to receive him, you are welcome to the Lord's table. Uh, additionally, I'll be in the back to pray with anyone who would love to pray and a team of prayer volunteers as well. If you have food allergies, you have a special station in the back and there's no ushers. So we're going to stand, we're going to pray, we're going to sing. You guys come forward whenever you're ready. So why don't you go ahead and stand up with me. Jesus, as we look at David's life, in some ways it's so comforting to see a man of God, a man who got so much of the Bible written about him, be such a mess. He had family drama, his own sin, his own insecurities. After he'd seen it all, he still blew it, and yet he was met with the grace of God. In so many ways, it's comforting to know in a room full of sinners like myself and everyone here uh, that we are welcome to your table. Not because we've cleaned anything else or up, but because the true anointed king, the one in David's line would come to take our sins away, Jesus Christ. God, I pray for our hearts and for our church that this would be true. As we enter into the Advent season now, um, God, that our hearts would be hearts of praise. Um, God, that if our hearts have grown stagnant, that we would do the discipline work of looking back and seeing your hand in our story and doing the discipline work of saying, God, you are worthy. I will sing to you. I will sit in your presence. I will give you my life. I will worship you because you're worthy. Even now as we sing, oh Jesus, what a friend, would it be true from our hearts? Would it be more than just words, but would it be a posture of praise springing forth uh, because we have known you through Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.